right. So the first thing I'm I'm Kim Salmon and I'm here um a courtesy of a couple of grants, one from the Kansas Humanity Humanities Council. Humanities Council Kansas. It used to be the Kansas Humanities Council, and I have trouble with my job. Uh, but uh, I do a speaker's bureau for them, so they're um, uh, they're one of your one of the uh, folks involved uh, for sitting here. And uh, I am an English professor at McPherson College. Uh, I have been there for 150 years or something like that. Came on the arc, you know. And uh, I teach. Uh, I'm a Shakespearean, but I teach. Uh, Events writing, creative, not just in poetry, British literature. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, we're going to talk about writing and family stories, and I want to start by see how much in my back. Am I trying to show? Yeah, better be back. Um, I want to start by telling you a couple of studies that to convince you of the importance of preserving and passing on your family stories. Uh, we have a few more chairs over here. If anybody wants wants to wants one. And uh, feel free to come around me and share. That's fine. Okay. And I think we have one more over there. Maybe. So we'll come and have a seat. If there are extra handouts around, I'm sure folks will get one. If there aren't, let me know. I might have a few left over from the last one class. Oh, good. Okay. So, um, so a couple of studies uh, to convince you of the importance of sharing, writing down, and sharing your family stories. Uh, and then one personal experience. And after that, um, I stopped talking in the So, so uh, in the mind, uh, there was a study about family stories that discovered something that people didn't really expect to find. Uh, the sociologists that conducted it uh, were surprised to find it, really, and did further studies because of what it led to. But what they discovered was that the, the stories that your family tells give you a picture of yourself and your place in the world and what things are valuable in the world and what you can expect from yourself and uh, what you can achieve and what you can uh, maybe not. So the family stories, it's very important to know them, but they can work actually in a negative direction. And one of the people that they did a quantitative study and then some qualitative interviews and one of the interviews, I want to tell you about just so you can see how powerful the stories are. There was a woman who at the time of the study was in her 40s. I'll call her Marion. And uh, the story in her family about her was that Marion never finished. It. So they would say, if there was a pie, you know, a piece of pie, and they said, well, that's Marion. She never finishes anything. Oh, Marion knows that she didn't finish. She's playing half the bathroom. Well, by the time they interviewed her in her 40s, she had had three failed marriages. She started college several times and not not gone very far, and she was, but there was no reason she couldn't go very far. And she told the interviewer, she said, "I just can't do this." Now you know that there was nothing genetic in her makeup that kept that might do it. On the other hand, family stories usually have a very positive impact, and I'll tell you that the more recent study it started at about 2000, but is an ongoing project. And it was done with children. And it started with children who had learning disabilities because a, a woman who was teaching them noticed this. So I'm going to tell you about this. And her husband was a sociologist. Like, watch out for sociologists. Don't study <laughs> anything. And so he got the news to him and studied it. What she discovered was she liked the students, the children who knew more about their families, were more resilient and more able to take in new techniques and more confident. Uh, about being able to master tasks. And so uh, so what the sociologists did, they made a little 20 question quiz. It's, they called it, what do you know? And it was just little things like, where did your grandparents grow up? Uh, where did your parents go to high school? Uh, what was one bad time that your family went through? Um, uh, what's one funny thing that your family knows? Uh, stuff like that. And the, sure enough, the students who could answer more of those questions uh, were tested much for uh, confidence in themselves, uh, resilience, uh, uh, confidence in their families and their families' ability to help to guide them. Uh, then, 2001, and these guys are living in New York, New York State, New York City. And so they thought, what an opportunity to test children because 2001, of course, traumatized everybody. So we've got this national trauma. 
It's on TV again and again and again, and children are traumatized by it. So they gave a bunch of children the same test, and these are not children with learning disabilities. It's a random, a very large random group of children. And sure enough, the children who could answer more of those questions, what do you know about your family, were more, less frightened, um, more confident in the resiliency, not just in themselves and their families, but of the country, uh, uh, less depressed by what they were seeing on the television, right? And so, so I think those are just two areas in which you know that recording family stories is important beyond your own desire to share your history and your family's history with the young people in your family. So third and last story, this is just personal anecdotal, right? I've done a lot of work for the Humanities Council in prison, in particular a several year long project with young men in uh, the Hutchinson Correctional Institution, uh, Institute, I guess. But anyway, um, uh, about uh, helping them learn how to read books to their children. You might think that, well, that's not hard. Uh, but a lot of these young men taught themselves to read in prison. And they were not at all confident about reading to their children. And no one had read to them when they were children. So I got to asking them the question that this is all based on, right? Like, and I'll ask it to you now. Uh, do you guys remember times? As you were growing up or any time in your, in your lives, when your extended family got together, like Thanksgiving or Christmas or whatever, and exchanged stories, told stories, and they tell the same stories, everybody could finish them, but you still like them. Sometimes when you're young, you're like, I love that story again. But, but when you're older, you like it. People can finish the story for you. You know, some of them are funny. Do hey, you have that experience? Okay, good, good. If you ask young men in prison, I, I counted up, I had asked uh, about 500 young men in groups of like eight, six to eight, out of that question over the years. Uh, and I started asking them because the first group I got this strange result. Nobody, nobody had that experience. And af after I'd asked about 500, I found two who did. And I, they were both African American. I don't know if that indicates a cultural thing, but. Uh, one of them, his mother was a first grade teacher, but all the other, all the other prisoners, and they would say things like, well, my parents were incarcerated, or, well, my parents both worked a couple of jobs, and so when they were home, they just had to feed us to make sure we were clean, or one of them said, and I always remember how he said it, he said, well, those days were, he said, those, those days was hard, and we was on the street, and what do you mean by that exactly, I don't know, but anyway, it kept the family from telling the story. I don't know that the lack of family stories had anything to do with their being in prison, but I suspect that there might be a connection, especially if knowing your family stories helps you find your, your place in the world, gives you confidence in what you can achieve, and things like that, which as a sociologist. All right, so now, uh, how many of you are doing genealogy? You're probably here because you're doing or thinking about it or want to. Okay, good. All right. Uh, some years ago, uh, a second or third cousin of my of my uh, grandfather on my father's side did the hard work of tracing the family tree on my grandfather's side. She did the genealogy, and she and we all have a copy of the book, and it's incredibly valuable. You learn a lot about your family. But I want to give you an example of how it sounds, and I'm not criticizing her. This is the way. This is the, the, just the facts. Genealogy. Here's here's a bit of it. Um, it starts here. Let's see. In 1823, Lieutenant David R. Stanley, living in East Tennessee, married Eliza Barnwell. He had two children while living in Tennessee, Charles Mack and Edward Payton in 1837. David was promoted to major in 1830. Eliza had two more children, Char Charlotte in 1831. All right. Uh, David was involved in the battles of. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a reference book. It's, and, we, and we do. But you're going to read from it during those Thanksgiving gatherings, are you? And your grandkids are not going to read from it. They'll look things up. So it presents only one side of our family story. And it, it's an important side, but it's, but it's no more important than the other side, okay? which is the stories that the family tells. Uh, so I'm going to show you, if you look at your handouts for a minute, we're going to talk about uh, the questions that people ask me when I do this workshop are often questions of permission. 
They'll say, not an English professor, so I can give it to you. So they'll say things like, well, can I use I? And I'm like, yes, my child, use I. And you know, well, can I can I call my Aunt Barbie? Aunt Barbie, or do I have to call her in songs? Aunt Barbie, you know, what is so, so I give you, I, I'm just going to start here and bestow upon you the English professor's permission to write however you feel like you should write this. It should be in your voice. If it's not in a personal voice, it's not interesting. A reader needs to have make contact with a human being through the writing. And you know this if you're readers, and I'm sure most of you are, if you read novels or history or the things that really keep you up at night reading are the things where you make real contact with somebody. Uh, who is the voice behind the work. So it needs to be you and it needs to be your voice. A good way to approach thinking of the stories, and I suggested two approaches. One I'm about to talk about, the other I probably won't get to, but it's interviewing other people in the family, and I've got advice for interviewing here with some examples, but I won't get to that. So, okay, so you can think about the elements of fiction. And you know, the English teachers always say five elements of fiction, but we're not going to deal with five elements. Because theme is unimportant. It will happen when you write. It's not important. Style isn't important. You're going to find your own. So you don't need to think about it. But the others are important. And I'm going to start with character. So when you write a story, if it's about you and your life, if it's in the nature of a memoir, then you are the voice of the author and the main character. But if you're writing a family story, you may well not be the main character. And what I want you to do right now, I want you to think for a minute. I always remember the music man when he tries to get the little kids to play without any instructions. Think, man, think. <laughs> I want you to think for a minute of a person in your family, living your dad, who might be a good character to write about. Now, this can be because the person's a talker, or because the person's had interesting experiences, or because uh, they're, they're, the person is a little bit mysterious, and you'd like to know more about them. I'm going to have you think for a minute and I'm going to ask you to tell me because you can get ideas from it. My brother is a kid. My great grandfather lived in a very Southern Baptist family and suggested that they needed a bucket of whiskey by the, by the front door and a dipper. If you thought it would loosen everybody up, yeah. <laughs> you can imagine how the women in the family reacted to this. this. Ah. Yeah. Okay, has anybody got a character? <clears throat> okay, I've got some one here and one up there. Yes. Uh, my three times great grandfather, Richard's family from um, Lancaster area of Pennsylvania. They were Michelin Mennonite. He moved them to what is now the state of Iowa, but back then, of course, it was not a state. One of the first settlers of that area. Wow. And in order to make money, he split rails all winter that winter wow. and sold them and then became a circuit preacher and preached to 10 different area churches and settled in that area. His son, my great-great-grandfather, was also a minister. Okay. Um, it makes you wonder about what their life was and what was like in Pennsylvania and then compare it to what it was like. It was because he was one of many sons. There wasn't really much land available. And so he brought his family to Iowa so that he could have land. And he farmed as well as for the, the minister. I'm very fortunate Iowa, or Johnson County, Iowa has biographies. Oh. of all the early settlers and so i've been able to find stories of several different sides of my family that's a fortune yeah. thing for sure right right very good very good i think there was one here yeah oh, no. um, my grandfather was a great storyteller okay. and um so it was easy to love to listen to him talk his uh my great grandfather was a banker and it came from his father coming into Kansas yeah. buying meals for the army. Oh. And, and it grew from that. But uh, they opened a, a bank in my hometown. Yeah. And 
and it, it, several generations have been there mm -hmm. in that town. And when the 1920s stock market crashed, yeah. of course, they lost everything. What makes it in the house? But he had wonderful stories about like the night was bootleg and they would have to buy things at the Oklahoma and they would bring it back to the bottle <laughs> and they would hide the bottles in the car, you know, where they roll the rain out of and what grounds he had a oh it just right these stories that he really worked at the bank that his father had owned and ran. And they were held up by Dylan. Oh, that's great. And it's not great. But it's <laughs> not great. <laughs> yeah. 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 Y
uh, it can be that he's happy, that he's evocative, belongs to your family, that evokes the past. Oh, good. Uh, so my great grandparents uh, lived in a township off the river in Nebraska, the Platte River. Oh, I love and, the Platte River. And had a large farm. And they were the uh, the contact for the Jesuit priest that used to come down the river to oh. celebrate mass for many people in the community. And they would come to my grand great grandfather's home and say mass. And I have or my family has the mass kit for oh. any Jesuit said that he used. Yes, the, yeah. another traveling minister actually over this week. There you are. Yeah. Oh, how nice and how evocative that is, you know, saying mass. Uh, yeah. I have a cousin who has the club that was given to my great grandparents when they got married. And it was a clock, or the, the people that gave that clock to them were the James family, uh, mother and stepdad of Frank and Jesse James. Oh. The James family attended the wedding. Okay, another great story. <laughs> Yeah, another object? Another object? Yeah. My grandparents were an expert. He wanted the owl cookie jar because it was so much trouble for stealing cookies. <laughs> <laughs> the horse, the lid, chipped and stuff. Because it's yellow. Yeah, when they right. started getting it out at Thanksgiving, and I made the cookies he did. And we pass it around. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> hearing it. Let me to remember. Yeah, I had, I had one woman whose his mother and her five sisters had a cookie jar that someone had made ceramics long ago. And they and it's so ugly. It's so amazingly <laughs> ugly. That they give it to each other at Christmas every year. So whoever has it, go around the whole fancy and give it to the next sister. And she can, the lady at the meeting who was older than I, I said, Do you know which family has it now? And she said, Oh, we don't even know which family has it. <laughs> so, so there can be things like that that don't have any intrinsic value in themselves, right? Any other objects? Yeah, go Mine ahead. Mine was my, my grandmother's cookie jar. Another cookie jar. None of my family's would get. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a, a teapot. And it was my mother's. I mean, I don't think I, I think she was the first one to have it. But it's Tom Tom the Piper's son. So it's kind of a plump little holding the pig. So when I whenever I was sick. You know, you got hot tea and <clears throat> cinnamon toast, and if you were really sick, the cinnamon toast was cut in shapes. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, yeah. But, but you know, it's that teapot, and of course, the, the pig's mouth is where you pour it from. So I always wanted to see the pig throw up. But <laughs> but yes, I I have that, and I need to tell that story so that. When my grandkids will want the thing. Yeah. Um, notice how that the reason I bring up the artifact, notice how they do each. Like, like to, if you're trying to think of the story, sometimes the thing to do is to is to is to, is to look at an object and, and and gather your memory of that of that object. I had one woman in Hutchinson, I found a workshop, and she was very she's very shy. And um uh, so I asked her. Because she looked like she had that look in her eyes as if she had thought of something. And she said, Well, it's not important. She said, uh, She said, uh, uh, could look at my mother got at her wedding, and it's just one of those Betty Crocker. Yeah, that was fine. Yeah, I got just been gnawed on by mice, you know. Uh, so, and, she, and I said, Oh, that's nice. And she, you know, she said, Yeah, and she said, that's a nice memory for me because her mother had died some years ago. And she said, when I open it, I can smell the smoke. And I said, was she that bad a cook? And she said, no, 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 it's from the fire. And I said, what fire? And she said, we had a small dairy farm uh, in somewhere in Missouri. And, 
and they lived here in Hassan and they were severely born. And uh, uh, one morning, that cold morning, they, they were up at 5 a.m. or whatever to milk the cows, you know. And uh, and all of a sudden, uh, they smelled smoke and they and they heard their their older son calling out. So they had a son who was about eight, and then they had two small children. I don't know, uh, three and two or, or four and three or something. And they go running out, and I, their house is burning. And the children had been, you know, in their bedrooms in the house, and they're in a panic, and they, they go running, and then they see the older child coming, carrying one child, and he was only, I, I said eight, but I think she said six, but, and, and with the other by the hand, and he had managed to, he had managed to get the older one out, and then to get out himself carrying the little one. And, and she said the fire had not started in the kitchen as it usually do. It had started some kind of heater in the living room. And so the kitchen actually survived. They, they, the fire, the neighbors managed to fire out and the house was rebuilt. And she said, then the cookbook. So she was like, who's that was? <laughs> Until she did it, she was smoke. So you, you never know. Right? You never know. I'm going to shift gears again here. Like I said, I'm used to 10 hours. So Stop me. I'm supposed to stop to say, you can stop me. Um, uh, I want to talk about the other thing, find the place. Okay, and I've got examples of my writing here that I put in just so you can see that I'm writing in the very in, in my my very own voice. You know, I'm not trying to sound like an English professor or anything like that. And when I talk about my mother, I call her mama. I'm assuming that the people who read my stories know who we are, and uh, of course they do. So so uh, find a place, mine is Brushy Man, and I want you to think of a place. <laughs> Brushy Man is a place where my great, great, great grandfather moved his, his eight children out of Virginia because he didn't want them to marry their cousin. They lived in the hills outside Rome, where a bunch of them still live, and they have married their cousins. In fact, one of his sons went back to marry a cousin. But anyway, so he, he moved them to first East Texas and then later they moved to West Texas. The town is no longer there, so it's it's not a place. It's a, if you read this, you'll see it's a chimney in the middle of a field, a pasture. So when you think of a place that might be significant to your family, it doesn't have to still be there. Although it can still be there, maybe you're still living in it, right? It can be, it doesn't have to be a house, it can be a church, it can be a cemetery. Visiting the old cemeteries is a great. A great thing to do and very bonding if you get a child or a grandchild to go with you, right? Or a sister or brother or something like that. It's great, it's really interesting. And I'm sure some of you have read for genealogy. It can be just a small town. Uh, one of my uh, uh, workshoppers thought of the um, in Rolla, in, I think it was right now, West Rolla. Uh, uh, they, her grandparents owned a um, filling station. And uh, it's it's just a little old filling station, the old-fashioned kind of pump with the bubble on top and everything. And it's no longer a filling station, but you know how it is in small towns. They don't torn it down. It's kind of it's got some bushes going around it and stuff like that. It's funny when she told about it, someone else said, well, my grandparents were from Roa. I know that filling station. You know, I'm not with it. So I want you to think of a place, and I'm going to ask some of you to tell us about thinking of a place. It can be a building. It can be a yeah, go ahead. Uh, house. <laughs> when I was a child, my grandparents lived on the farm, and this was like in the early 50s, and they didn't have the convenience of mobile phones. Yeah. And so the outhouse was an obstacle. You know? Plus, they had chickens, and at least for one summer, they had a kind of an aggressive rooster. And so it involved <laughs> having your stick at the gate and had to fight off. But the funnier story was so that a few years later, my sister and I are riding a horse and we got the notion we should pick apples. And so we went and got a bucket and we attached it to the saddle where you would normally put a lasso. Mm -hmm. And so we then go into the by the trees and we're picking apples from the horse's back. Putting them in the bucket, yeah. and that mare went to work. Oh no! And so first she raced to the barn through my sister, and then she raced to the house and threw me off. Oh. 
and she departed down the road <laughs> spewing blood from the rafters. And we are terrified. So we lock ourselves in the outhouse. <laughs> Standing. Out of our story. There you go. The horse lived and nobody punished us. Oh, we have no recollection of any kind of punishment. I think they probably learned our lesson. And that maybe it wasn't such a crazy idea. It just didn't. It just didn't. All the pleasures got the little plumbing. Yeah. Anybody else a place? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, my, uh, my second great -grand grandfather's on a 1880s map in Illinois. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at it, I'm looking at Google Maps and going, right, right. I can drive there. I can get there. Yeah. yeah. So we're driving and my wife's driving. I said, okay, honey, it's the next farm field. We're going to stop right here. We're going to stop. And that's where they live. And you can see the buildings that were coming up. So we pull up, you know, and so it's about the middle of nowhere. It looks like Kansas. Flat. <laughs> all these buildings. I get out of the car. You can still smell where they had burnt down the house like the week before because there was a rubble of oh, house was still sitting there. Yeah, all the, the barns were there, the outhouse was there yeah. and everything. And I'm going, I'm gonna go get one of those bricks. Yeah. <laughs> so now I have a artifact. I'm gonna have a good story. I have to write. Just this long is long here. I still smell the smoke. Yeah, in fact, they right after they, they had burned it in great part of, yes. the, part of the story. Like, yep. <laughs> but the but the tower was there, and the outhouse is a very intimate part of the house. You can still see them. So good, yeah. The search to find something is 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 really good, and you can write about the search too. Yeah, Pam. So I was back in Taylorsville, Kentucky, searching my uh, grandfather and second great grandfather. Yeah. They were all from that area. Third great grandfather. And I had been um, reading about him and some of the materials I had that my third great grandfather ran a grist mill there in town yeah. uh, with another man. And they described where the mill was and that they had dug this, uh, they called it a mill race, oh, yeah. which diverted the water out of the Salt Creek River over to run the mill. And then it went back in the river. And so I had the map and I kind of looked at it in terms of town hasn't changed much. It's a very small town. And I could knew where the modern river was. And so I thought, well, I'm just gonna go out there and see if I can yeah. find it. Well, of course, the the mill itself, you know, was built of wood and it's not gonna be there anymore. But um, I got up on this hill and I thought, you know, there's some old stone foundations up there yeah somebody owns that land now but i couldn't figure out who to ask permission so i just wandered around well forgive me for the decision. well yeah and so i'm wandering around there and it was really high growing up with weeds and i thought oh you know if i twist an ankle no one's gonna even know i'm there you know but there's no rats and snakes and the more i thought about that the more i creeped out i got and i thought no, i don't really think i want to tromp around through all this rubble and then i turned around and I happened to look towards the river, yeah. and it had been pretty dry there. And so the grass was all kind of yellow and brown, yeah. but there was a green line that came from the river and looped around and went back into the river. The mountains. And I went down there, and sure enough, it, there was still a remnant of that race there, it which was, you know, so deep, and it had been mostly grown up in weeds. But that was such a cool moment that I. That's the that's cool thing about a place or an artifact is that, is that, you know, now that, especially now that we're all online and all this stuff, I, one of my favorite um, sociologists, <laughs> <laughs> I have a quote from her, uh, um, technology makes us forget what we know about being human. And I think that's true sometimes. I mean, I'm grateful for my stuff. But, but I think it's true sometimes. But touching something from the past or discovering something from the past, something that's there, even if the, the, the building is no longer there, it's meaningful. It, it, you have this rush of a feeling that's like a feeling you get from many past, right? Uh, or touching something and, and hearing a history, knowing a history, uh, passing around the cookie jar, right? Things like that. It's meaningful. Now, these are all just ways for you to, to think of stories, to come up with stories. 
Uh, because if, sometimes when you sit down to write, you think, well, now I'm going to write. It's like, don't you want to cookie? No, I'm going to write. Do you want some coffee? Yeah. So the thing is, you can think of these things twice and just start writing about them. And stories will come. You can think of the cookie jar or whatever it is and just start to write. And stories will come to you. Okay. So let's look at, back at my handout a little bit. I have some advice for you and a double backer example. No, not my time. Mine plays salsa music. You'll know what I'm going to turn it off. <laughs> so, uh, use the techniques of fiction. Right? That's what we call creative nonfiction. Uh, so, and what it does is it just frees you, you know? Uh, so, for example, you're telling a story that happens to your great, great, great uncle in the 1890s, right? And it involves an encounter with somebody. And you can say, and it, suppose you would like to use one of the techniques of fiction, which is dialogue, right? Because it's very immediate. And what you know, what you've heard from the story is kind of what they said to each other. And so you can say, I imagine, I imagine the conversation went like this. Right? And those little lines are your, your permission that you give yourself. You go ahead and be a little creative. You want to stay true to your story because of the, whatever it is about the story is the reason it's being told. And so you, you know, but but you know kind of what the interchange was, and so you can say, I think the conversation went like this, and then you can do your little bit of dialogue. You can step in and describe what it was like to be with the person if you knew them, like what was it like to be with your storytelling again. Um, uh, how did he talk? Not you know. Um, uh, one of my my great grandfather Papa, the one with the whiskey barrel, uh, always had a pipe in his mouth, even though the women wouldn't let him light it up in, in the house. You know, at one time he was outside smoking it, and my aunt Edith came out there. Two two Southern Baptist maiden ladies, school teachers, who were his daughters. My aunt Edith came out there and said, "Papa," she said, "that smoking's going to kill you." He was, at that point, he's eighty nine, and he said, "Yes, Edith, it's going to get me one of these days," because at eighty nine he figured. <laughs> So anyway, uh, uh, you can tell about their presence uh, uh, if you know them. You can describe their photo, comments. Um, uh, so the te techniques of fiction, the things that, that grip you. Another technique of fiction I want you to remember is people will ask me, how do I start the story? Okay. The one thing you don't do is start at the very beginning. Because the very beginning is like, um, uh, in 1923, Lieutenant David <laughs> So you don't want to start there. Uh, if people want to tell about their great grandmother, often they feel like they ought to begin with, well, she was born at this day in this town. But your readers don't have any reason to be interested in her yet. So if you start with something like, all her life, my great grandmother Rosie Bell wore another man's ring on her wedding finger. And then you can go back and say, Rosie Bell was born at this day in this place because the readers are going to want to know why she wore another man's ring on the wedding finger. So, yeah, the story is there. So, what you want to do is start with the most interesting part. And don't worry about it. people say, well, people don't know who Rosie Bell is. They don't care yet. So, you have to say something to them. I have promises it's going to be true. And then you can have a paragraph of really exposition, you know, the stuff about where she grew up and all that stuff. And then you go back to the story, right? So uh, another technique of fiction that you can use is that way to start. How do you end? You end when it feels like you're finished. Uh, whenever I see a student uh, begin the last paragraph with any conclusion, therefore, I know the writer is bored. I can hear it in the other readers. <laughs> so you start when you feel like it's an ending. Okay. Um, I've got advice about um, some of it I've already mentioned. General advice for writing. Uh, and so this I've mentioned to you one never worry about where to begin, begin with what fits in your head and a good opening will happen. Stop when you feel like you're finished. Number three is the most important right right now, immediately. While you're thinking about it, I carry actually, I am old fashioned enough to carry a little notebook. My students 
that they, they don't carry any paper or writing utensil at all. If I write something on the board, they take a picture of it. Right, but that's not me. Uh, yeah, it's, it's universal. That's almost all of them. Anyway, uh, to have something with you that you can write on in whatever manner you prefer to write. Uh, if you're comfortable with the technology, uh, you can record on the phone. You can, you can tell your phone stuff and then put it in words later, right? in, in written word. Read your writing out loud. How does it sound? Anything that's hard to read, then that's what you fix. If it's hard to read, maybe the sentence is too long, maybe it's awkward, maybe it doesn't sound like yourself, right? And that's when you, you tell it to yourself. How would I say this to someone? How would I tell this to my 15-year-old grandson? Yeah. In right. Simplify. Short words are usually better than long. And there's a historical reason for that in English. It's not true about Romance languages. But English is originally Germanic, and our oldest words come from um, a descendant of Old West Germanic, Anglo-Saxon, and they're short. You know, they're short words. And so, uh, so those are the words closest to our heart, words like love and make and do and words like that. So short is usually better than long. Not always, but usually. Then I've got some things that you could read here. William Zenser. Who died in his 90s? Do you know I love Oh, I love Red Everybody. He's wonderful. He was a reporter and then a nonfiction writer. Uh, and uh, he wrote, these are not textbooks because textbooks on writing are incredibly badly written. I thought that I could make myself say it to read. But since he writes really well, and he's a professional writer. And on writing well, I think he's the best, but he also wrote Inventing the Truth, the Art and Craft of Memoir, which can be helpful with your own story or your family story and everything you write. Uh, then, as an example for a memoir made up of little, what we call, call it fast fiction or fast nonfiction, little pieces, maybe half a page, maybe four pages. Baby Quite Small Makes Up Her Mind is, is wonderful. It's, it's interesting. It's memoir and also family stories because it's based around her mother. Uh, it's funny. It's, it's moving. It's one of those things where you can read for 15 minutes and then read for another 15 minutes later on. So I recommend that. General advice for interviewing, uh, as I told you, we'll get to that, but about what kinds of questions to ask and uh, um, how to write it up. Okay. I've got the same thing. Questions? You folks? They're going to drive it down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Enjoy it.